Good morning. We welcome you today, whether you are here in person or whether you're on the video streaming this morning, we welcome you to this, our celebration of the life of Dr. Robert Vernon Digman. Thank you for coming. Let us pray. Eternal God, our help in every time of sorrow Send your Holy Spirit to comfort and strengthen us that we may have the hope of life eternal and trust in your goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand if you're comfortable and join together in our opening hymn, there's a wideness in God's mercy. It's printed in your bulletin. Robert Vernon Digman, Ph.D., age 92, of Philippi, West Virginia, died Wednesday, September the 7th, 2022. He was born January 9, 1930, the son of the late Alice Weekly and Stark Luther Digman in Taylor County in the coal mining community of Wendell, West Virginia. Robert is survived by his wife of 41 years, Jane Bryant Digman, a daughter, Rebecca, and husband, Steve Hooman, three sons, Mike and wife, Sally, Steve and Alan and wife, Stacy, two stepchildren, Ivan Bryant and Don McGrage, two sisters-in-law, both named Charlene, six grandchildren, plus others in the extended family, and a favorite cousin, Nancy Bartlett, and numerous cousins, nieces, and nephews. Preceding him in death were his parents, two adult younger brothers, Charles of Grand River, Ohio, and Ronnie of Perry, Ohio, and his former wife, the mother of his children, 
Betty Jean Bowles. One brother, Stark Eugene, died in infancy prior to Robert's birth. He attended public schools in Taylor County where he got his first taste of academic success. According to Bob, he started first grade in the middle of the school year after his family moved and his report card for that year states grade one. At the end of the year, in the space that says this is to certify that the above student completed the work as outlined in the course of study for the second grade and is hereby promoted to the third grade. So he was able to jump a grade. <laughs> he continued to excel in the public schools graduating from Flemington High School as the valedictorian of his 1947 class. In 1951, he earned a Bachelor of Science Chemistry with magna cum laude honors at Alderson Broadus College. He played basketball with the Pelez brothers and others returning GIs on Rex Pyle's basketball teams. Continuing his education at the University of Maine, he met the requirements for Master of Science Chemistry in 1953. Next, he pursued of a doctoral degree at Penn State University, resulted in a PhD in chemistry in 1963. Between his commitment to, stu to studies and the beginning of his family, he was a professor of chemistry at Marshall University, first as an assistant, then associate professor. Also, President Robert Shear convinced him to teach chemistry at Alderson Broadus College during the academic years of 1954 to 1956. And he began his 35 plus year career at Alderson Broadus College in 1965 as the chairman, Division of Natural Science and Professor of Chemistry, soon adding chairman of Applied Sciences. Continuing up the ranks, he became the academic dean in 1982 before being the interim president in 1994 to 1995. And he maintained his standing as professor of chemistry and routinely taught a chemistry course. Upon retirement, he completed a course for real estate agents and learned much about Barber County while selling real estate. His employment history includes graduate assistant in chemistry, the University of Maine, Orono, Maine, research assistant in petroleum chemistry at Penn State University, State College, Pennsylvania in 1953, and again, research assistant in petroleum chemistry at Penn State University from 1956 to 1959. And at Penn State, he participated in the research of Merrill Finsky a well-known researcher in the petroleum industry, and he was published with Fenske and others in four publications. During his administrative years at AB, he was invited to be a consultant evaluator for North Central Association of Colleges and Schools, and Dr. Digman was a participant in 20 evaluation teams, serving as the chair on 11 of those teams. He actively participated in Philippi Kiwanis, where he provided leadership for many years. He was a member of the Philippi Chamber of Commerce. He was a longtime member of the Philippi Baptist Church, serving as a coordinator of an adult men's class for several years. He maintained a long-term commitment to the Broadus Hospital Board of Trustees, and as well as serving on the larger Davis Health System Board. He was devoted to the education of students and improving the educational opportunities at Alderson Broadus College, now University. And in 2020, for his years of service, the university awarded him an honorary degree, Doctor of Education. However, his greatest honor is the success of former students in their fields of study especially in chemistry and medicine, where there were many. Anyone like Bob Digman is more than an obituary. And we have some who will share some of that additional highlights for us at this time.
Hello, friends and family. It's wonderful to see you here. Thank you so much for coming to honor Bob today. He was a great guy, wasn't he? Just think the world of him. Uh, I've known Bob in a number of different ways, and it did start out in my introduction to Alderson Broadus College. I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, and had to decide where I wanted to go to college, and I had applied both here and at uh, Ohio Wesleyan, which was my dad and sister's college of choice. I went there for a year and decided, nope, I really wanted to come to West Virginia. Bob sent me a letter as dean of students, of course I didn't know him at all, and said that I could come to AB as a transfer student, but they couldn't accept my foreign language of Italian to meet my language requirement because they didn't offer that here. And I wrote him back a letter and said, then I will not be coming because I managed to get a C and that was a gift in my Italian classes. <laughs> I am foreign language challenged. And I received another letter that said, oh, come on, we're okay with that. So that was my first interaction with Bob. This was in 1975, no, 1973, I'm sorry. Um, and I really didn't have cause to have much to do with him while he was here. I was a social work sociology major, and he was over in that other building, Kemper, and in New Maine. So I knew who he was, and I knew he was well respected, but I didn't know much about him. I later learned that Bob had been a student here himself, and I'm sure most of you know that, he had a benefactor who uh, allowed him to go to college here. He was very fortunate. Um, I can't imagine A.B. without Bob. When he came to A.B., you saw a few things, and, and Danny read a few things about what Bob did when he was here. He uh, did play basketball with the, the Rex Pyle team, my grandson talking to me. Uh, he was very happy to have a part in that whole program. To the, to the end of his days, he talked about how much he loved to play basketball with Rex Piles. Uh, he also was class president, and of course, he did a very good job in school as a chemistry major. But there's a few things you might not know about Bob, maybe you do, um, that as a family member, I've later learned about, that at the time he was in school, White Scarver at the entrance of the college was the men's dorm, and the second two floors uh, of Old Main were the women's dorm. So there were some shenanigans going on at that time between the men and the women. And one of those shenanigans that I got the biggest kick out of was that there was a lot of farmland around AB and uh, somehow Bob and his cronies, including Dick Withers, who I know many of you knew Dick, who was Bob's roommate in college, found a cow brought the cow to Old Main, somehow got it into Old Main, and somehow got it into the elevator, and sent it up to the girls' dormitories. Lots of laughter over that one. That's what I know about Bob when he was in school. When he finished school, he did come to AB as a, a teacher for a couple years. I know he was terribly committed to his students. He even held class while his wife was in labor. The whole group of nursing people, I believe, in his chemistry class thought for sure they'd have the day off of school, but no, he showed up while Betty Jean was in labor with my husband, Mike. So, very committed, yes. From then, he moved on uh, to his graduate work, and uh, I had married his son and knew him only in the way of one would know a father-in-law, which he always treated me like a daughter. And I can't say enough about that, and if I try, I won't be able to do it, so I won't. But um, about 15 years after I graduated, I decided I'd like to come back to AB to work. I had finished my doctorate, and there was an opening, and uh, I wanted it, but he was going to be my boss if I came. So of course, he would have nothing to do with that, fair Bob. Um, did not involve himself in any of those interviews, but I did get hired anyway. And he was my boss for 19 years. Well, not quite that much. He did retire a little bit before I left AB. 
So I had the pleasure of having him as a wonderful father-in-law and also as a wonderful boss. I have another wonderful boss sitting up there in Anne Serafin. But I really could say about Bob as a high quality teacher, the students that I knew who had him for a teacher said he was the best. Can you imagine anybody saying that about a chemistry teacher? That they liked to go to class, that he was so good. Um, he also had the respect of his peers, this Bob Maruka up here. Um, he helped to design the Kemper Building and chaired the Division of Natural Sciences for many years and accomplished a great deal through his love of science and for the students who would be science majors and having to take science classes. He was very committed to the sciences, not only in his academic life, but in his personal life too. He was a scientist at all times. <laughs> um, as a boss and as a member of a college staff, those of us who worked with Bob, and there are many of you in here today, who Bob was their boss as provost, academic dean. I think we could all agree that, again, he was fair-minded Bob. Uh, if he had a position on something, he certainly listened to everyone who had something to say. And then he made a final decision. He was kind. He was compassionate. He started every meeting on a light note, even if he knew that the meeting was going to be a tough one. I learned a lot from him for when I later took on similar duties that if you help people understand that you are there as someone who is there to help you as a faculty member and to help you do the best job that you can, it really helps to get a lot done. And Bob did that in his work at AB. Um, he was followed by a guy named Dennis Stahl, who I'm sure is listening today. And Dennis sent me a, a message, and I just wanted to read one, of, one a short thing that he said. Uh, as academic dean, his ability to de-escalate difficult situations served as a model for my time in that role. I can't tell you how much that means on a college campus. College campuses can be a very toxic place for people who work there, but Bob made it a joy to work at AB and be a faculty member. Everyone felt he was um, listening to them and then making solid decisions based on what he felt at the end, and he took responsibility for them. So that is my perception on Bob at AB. Uh, let me see if I didn't say something I wanted to. Oh, I wanted to add on to Danny's uh, comments from the obituary. Bob did AB a huge service by being involved with the national level of accreditation of colleges. It's very difficult to have your college accredited. You have to meet a very high set of standards. And Bob set the scene for that at AB. He made sure that we were doing the things that nationally had been laid out that you do when you want to be recognized as an excellent institution. And he served on a number of teams that went out and evaluated other schools so that he was fully versed in that to be able to help us do the best job we could here at AB. And uh, many of you sitting in here have been part of Higher Learning Commission reviews, as have I. So he really helped to set the standard for academics here at AB. And then when he moved into interim presidency and retirement, um, I really respected him for the way that he handled that, still being in the community, but allowing people, as he always had done, to understand their job, but then let them do it. So thank you. That's my perception of, of Bob at AB. Oh.
morning. I'm Susie Savecco, an employee of Broadus Hospital for 47 years. And I'll have to say, when I am in this chapel, I can just see myself rolling down those steps. So, <laughs> so I'm very cautious. But it's an honor to speak in regard to Dr. Robert Digman. I saw Dr. Robert Digman as a quiet servant to our community, Otterson Broadus College, now the university, in healthcare, and I really got to know him from a healthcare perspective because of Broadus Hospital. He was an honest man, fair and respected in many roles he served with a quiet reserve. His leadership and values persisted through both times of challenge and prosperity at Broadus Hospital. From a nursing perspective, the challenging times were difficult. However, on occasion, after several resignations, the remaining staff worked together, more dependent on each other, to staff the hospital and continued our mission to give the best care possible to our patients. As I remember my nursing career at Broadus, it makes me proud to know that I and my colleagues have made a difference in the lives of our friends, neighbors, and our community. In prosperity, at the groundbreaking for the new hospital, there were tears of joy and praise for the leadership, which included Dr. Robert Digman, that a modern community hospital would continue to be an asset to Philippi and Barber County. Dr. Digman's professional expertise in the classroom and knowledge of health care has helped us all be better stewards in our community. His appreciation of the employees, and especially the nurses at Broadus Hospital, was always visible and shared, thanking those for their commitment. You knew his comments and thank yous were from the heart. And I just learned this morning in talking with a friend that I've known for many years. Matter of fact, I grew up in the same community a short time when I was younger that she grew up in, and that's Barbara Cole Bryan. And Barbara was a nursing student here at AB College. And she shared with me this morning that her father, Dorsey Cole, had taught Bob chemistry at Flemington High School. And then when Barbara came to AB, Dr. Digman taught her chemistry at AB. So we never know how our connections will end up meeting each other. Another colleague that attended AB College was Norma Workman, and Norma and I worked many years together and remained very good friends. And Norma shared this quote with me, that God sends you people for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. We were definitely blessed to have Dr. Robert Digman for many seasons. Thank you. I'm a dad taller than what Susie is. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Doak, and I had the opportunity to be the uh, administrator of Davis Health System from 2001 through the end of 2015. And Jane gave me a call, and during our conversation, she made a couple comments. She said that Bob worked hard throughout his life, and I've heard that. But she also said that people looked after Bob and gave him opportunities. And it was mentioned earlier by Sally that someone gave him the opportunity to come to college. But I think it's also important to know that Bob, not if, if people looked after him, 
He looked after people. And I think that's very important too. He wanted to make improvements wherever he could. He knew that education and health care were important and fundamental needs of a community to grow and to, and to prosper. We've heard about what he did at AB and his and education, so I want to talk about health care a little bit. In 1994, Bob joined the, the board of Broadus Hospital. In 2000, he joined the board of Davis Health System. As a board member, you have to realize he was my boss, as all board members are. I work for them. Bob knew that he represented the community. He also represented the people within that community. He wanted to make sure that the best health care possible was provided for the communities that he looked after. My role as administrator was to follow the lead of Bob and the other board members through this role. And but, <coughs> excuse me, Bob was passionate about, passionate about his health care board role. He was always at board meetings. He was always at committee meetings. He attended the retreats, the educational centers. As a leader, he was stepped forward to be president of the Broadus Board. He was secretary of the Davis Health System Board. Whenever there was a need, Bob stepped forward. Whether that was attending a community meeting or at various times when we went to Washington, D.C. for various needs, he was always willing to be that person to step forward and to help. But Bob was not one to maintain the status quo. He wanted to improve and he wanted to move forward. During his tenure, and it was mentioned at Broadus Hospital, um, Broadus Hospital became an affiliate of Davis Health System. A new Broadus Hospital was also built during that period of time. And I was thinking about this, there's a, something called a critical access hospital. If I'm not mistaken, Broadus was the second hospital in the United States to obtain that, cla that classification under the Medicare program. Again, looking towards the future and not maintaining the status quo. At the system level, there were new clinics built, new services, even the Davis Memorial Hospital expanded their footprint by almost 50 percent. Yes, there were struggles within the facility, but quite honestly, while all their hospitals around us were downsizing and struggling, Davis Health System remained strong and continued to grow. So Bob was a board member. How did he, as one of the board members, shape this and shape the future? Well, I can tell you at board meetings, Bob listened. He thought, he listened, he smiled, and then he spoke. I'm not sure how many of you remember the, uh, excuse me, the old E.F. Hutton commercial. When E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Well, I can tell you, when Bob's, Bob spoke, everyone, and I mean everyone, listened. Bob was the voice of reason. He was well respected in the board, and as I said, when he spoke, it was very informative, very clear, and people wanted to hear what he had to say. So I'm a numbers person. People know me by that. Can we measure the success of Bob and his effects on the community? I began with a comment by saying that education and healthcare are fundamental needs of a community. Without this, a community will not grow, it will not prosper. As a state, we know that West Virginia has been losing population. We all know that. But what about Barber County? From 1994, when Bob joined the Broadest Board, through 2016, when Bob left the Davis Health System Board, the Barber County population grew by 850 people, over 5%. So you have to step back and say, is that all because of Bob? No. But if Bob had not been passionate, committed, hardworking, and during the heavy lifting to get things done in health care and in education, I don't think this 5% increase in the Barber County population would have been possible. So yes, I think we can do a measurement out here to say, did he have an influence? Definitely. So as I say, Bob was the voice of reason for patients, for health care, 
and for the community. His efforts were greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Well, I guess I'm in the middle height wise. I'm the daughter and I have the honor today of sharing a tribute from a very dear friend and colleague of my dad's, Dr. Dan Unger, who was a professor of philosophy for many years at AB. With the death of Dr. Robert Digman, Alderson Broadus University, Philippi, Barber County, and higher education in West Virginia have lost a beloved friend, mentor, citizen, example, and colleague to many Barber County citizens and especially the AB faculty and staff, as well as unnumbered students. Bob was, truly, Mr. AB. Guiding the institution as vice president, dean, and fellow faculty member through the winds of academic life and development. Bob kept a genuine sense of humor through the ups and downs, especially of the academic program and institutional accreditation. That being said, Bob was a scientist who chaired the AB Division of Natural and Applied Sciences for many years prior to, prior to taking on administrative duties. Yet, though a scientist, he was also a man of considered, thoughtful Christian life, faith, which some may view a rare com combination, but I dare say not so at all. Bob was my personal friend, overseer, fishing buddy, and older brother. I shall miss him, but feel a genuine blessing having partnered with him for over 35 years in higher education at AB, as well as for the 48 years I was a fellow citizen of Barber County. Thank you, Bob, for your friendship, guidance, direction, and encouraging oversight. Rest in peace, dear colleague. My condolences to the Digman family. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Sorry about that. Technology is a wonderful thing until it's not. Uh, I'm Alan. Uh, I'm the baby. And I'm going to share a couple of stories that like up. Oh, okay, I guess I'm one of the taller ones. Okay, well, I'm still Alan, and uh, I'll share, share a few stories uh, about things that even you all, brothers and sisters, may or may not know about. But first, I want to uh, offer a heartfelt thanks to Dr. Frankie and others, Josh Allen, the folks in the, in the cafeteria, and innumerable probably other people who helped us put this together today. We absolutely could not have done that. Um, without everyone's assistance. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you. So, a few father and son memories. The, the first one, um, anybody who's younger me, than me probably wouldn't know about. I was just talking to Mark Doak about it just a few minutes ago. Years ago, when you were going to install a faucet or, or something like that, the, the internet didn't exist, all right? documentation really didn't exist. Often what you got was a little plastic record that you could play on a record player that gave you the instructions. We should have known that we were in trouble when we opened the box for a faucet, we're gonna install a faucet, and the record was folded in half. <laughs> well, that didn't stop my dad. <laughs> so, I say we, he dove in, and he was underneath the, the sink with a torch, which, Think about that for just a moment. But uh, anyway, smoke started coming up. And I said, you know, I, I think we might have a problem. And he said, oh, no, 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 we're going to be fine. Our house is still there, so I think everything turned out okay. But um, I, I remember that one vividly for a variety of reasons. Let's see what else I want to tell you. Oh, the, the fishing trip. Everybody always talked about the year-end fishing trip. And we were talking earlier that my dad and, and his friends and, and colleagues, Dr. Withers and Dr. Unger and, and others, pretty much as soon as graduation was finished, they were gone. 
And for years, they went to Minnesota to, I believe it was Carl Tideman's uncle's place. And I remember seeing photographs of these giant strings of fish that they caught. Well, since I was a little kid, I always wanted to go. <laughs> and she's like, no, 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 you're not going to go. Finally, we got to go, or I got to go. And I thought, you know, well, I don't know what, I, what to expect. You know, you got all these guys. That, it was a lot of sleeping. It was a little bit of fishing. It was a little bit of catching of fish. Um, and just as an aside, those of you who remember uh, Mr. Labello and his son John, John and I had not seen each other for many, many, many years. And we ran into each other in one of those fishing trips. So they were interesting. Uh, for example, just as I am, Mr. Labello was deathly afraid of snakes. That's me. And so the river and the lakes that they would fish in down in Tennessee and in Kentucky, um, there were a lot of snakes. And it was not uncommon, my understanding is, that you could see Mr. Labello up on top of the houseboat in a chair way up on top so he would be okay. Then there's the year that my sister Becky went on the Austria trip, spent what, three months or however long it was, and it was just my dad and I at home. And he was doing his best to feed me and take care of me and cook for me and, and so on, which was a challenge because I didn't eat vegetables. Well, I ate corn, okay? That was, that was the only vegetable that existed. And he actually sent my sister a letter and asked if there was a way that she knew of to make green vegetables look like corn. So I, I don't know the outcome of that, but I'm still standing, so it all worked out. Um, I won't go into it, but I pretty much disappointed him with algebra. That, that's, a, that's a whole different thing. And, and the whole chemistry thing jumped all over top of me and landed on my son, Connor. He, eats that up. Uh, had the good fortune when we arrived in the uh, Alumni Center last night to uh, spend some time talking with Susie Jones, Dr. Dr. Shear's daughter, and uh, we reminisced, you know, probably quicker than, than what we'd have preferred, but we talked, and what really came out of that conversation was the commitment of that generation of, of folks, not just my dad, Dr. Smith, Mrs. Smith, Dr. Withers, Dr. Unger, you know, we can, you know, name and, and, and keep going. They were the bedrock, Dr. Shearer, they were the bedrock of, of AB. You know, there's, I don't know all the details, but there was a, a great, um, a great transition during that time when they all arrived and, and did their thing. Um, and it, uh, it, it just was a special time. I can remember when I was a kid, and I'll, I'll say this, you know, AB is a very small, or AB, Philip is a very small town, and that's fine, because I had the good fortune to grow up here, and I'm glad my parents chose to, uh, to settle here. But as Susie and I were talking, and, and my wife Stacy, at one time, I believe there were 25 or so kids in our neighborhood and we all played together. We played in Shears Field, right beside the president's house. We played baseball, we played football, we broke windows in the Shears basement, <laughs> and so on. So my, you know, other than of course my children, those kinds of things, my fondest and my best memories are here. Philippi is my, my home. Philippi is where I grew up. Philippi is where I was raised. And uh, I couldn't have asked for better parents. I could not have asked for um, a, a more fair and even keeled dad. You know, the word fairness has been used a lot today, and I would echo that, that uh, to the extent that I have a sense of fairness, it came from him. There's no question about that. So to wrap up, I want to say that I love you, Dad. I miss you, and I know that we'll see each other again when God sees fit. Thank you. If you'll stand, if you're comfortable, in the bulletin is the hymn, the first two verses of How Great Thou Art.
We draw comfort and we draw encouragement from God's Word. I have some scriptures to share that are for comfort and some that remind me and Jane and those who knew Bob of Bob. So I begin with words of comfort found in the 23rd Psalm, where the psalmist reminds us, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And being in this beautiful state of West Virginia, I think many of us draw comfort from the 121st Psalm as well, where the psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains, from whence shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Words of Jesus in the Gospel of St. John. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall have life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now two scriptures that come to my mind. One was a recommendation from Jane. The first one, mine from the prophet Micah in the sixth chapter the eighth verse, it says, He has told you what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And Jane asked me to share from the Gospel of Luke, the 10th chapter, and I certainly agree with her that it's a good scripture for this occasion. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this, and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell upon robbers, and they stripped him, and they beat him, and they went off leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest was going down on that road. And when Jesus saw him, excuse me, and, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan who was on a journey came 
upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word this day. You know, my path crossed with Bob Digman in a lot of different ways. The very first one was when I was first hired. He was on the committee that interviewed me. He was the interim academic dean at the time, and I'm still here. <laughs> so I don't know if he did well or not, but anyway. And then the second, the second, well, and of course, all through the years, I saw him on campus teaching, and he was here, and Philippi Baptist, we were both there. But then one day he talked to me and he said, Danny, why don't you consider being on the hospital board? And we talked about that, and the next thing I know, he was, he was instrumental in getting me on the hospital board. And then he retired and he started going to Hardee's, and I'd already been going to Hardee's many times. And he'd be there in the morning reading the newspaper, and he was now a real estate agent. Now, personally, I don't think he was that good as a real estate agent because he and I had a deal that he was going to find a 100-acre farm in Barber County for $10,000 for me to buy, and he never found it. <laughs> but he always looked, <laughs> and we always talked about it, and we had good conversations about many different things. And this memorial service reminds us that even a good life and a long life does not go on forever, for we are all created with a limit to our days on earth. Every day is a gift from God, and Bob sought to share that gift, the kingdom of God, by way of actions over words. St. Francis of Assisi once said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. And we have heard testimony this morning of just that in the life of Bob Dickman. Bob shared many stories with me about his growing up poor in Taylor County. And all through life, his life, it seems there were key people that mentored him, that supported him in every way and encouraged him to accomplish what never seemed possible to a country boy from Flemington High School. <laughs> and I have no doubt that this played a key role in shaping his Christian faith by way of seeking to do the same for others. Bob's Christian faith was less about the kingdom of God in heaven, that is life after death, and more about living out the kingdom of God while we're here on earth. Whether that was fishing with fellow disciples, <laughs> taking the time to read newspapers to an elderly Dr. Shear with failing eyesight, or seeking to find a home for a young couple while working as a realtor. In so many ways, he preached the gospel and needed no words. Perhaps that is why one of his favorite books was The Heart of Christianity by Marcus J. Borg, in which Borg writes these words, Paul affirms an afterlife, yet his letters suggest that his primary emphasis was new life in Christ in this life, a metaphor that has both personal and social dimensions. Borg goes on to state that the joys Paul celebrates are known in this life, freedom, peace, love, joy itself. 
Jane, let me glance at that book to get a sense of a book that meant so much to Bob. And the quote that I just shared with you, he highlighted in that book. It meant something to him. There's another story that I've run across. Don't worry, it's a short one. It says there's a monk on his travels once found a precious stone and kept it. One day he met a traveler, and when the monk opened his bag to share his provisions with him, the traveler saw the jewel and asked the monk to give it to him. The monk did so readily. The traveler departed, overjoyed with the unexpected gift of the precious stone that was enough to give him wealth and security for the rest of his life. However, a few days later, he came back in search of the monk, found him, gave him back the stone, and entreated him, now give me something much more precious than the stone, valuable as it is. Give me that which enabled you to give it to me. You have heard the testimony of many valuable stones that Bob Digman has given to others, but maybe the most valuable of all of that is what entreated him to do that for others. And finally, Bob reminds me of Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, when Paul writes, you yourselves are our epistle, our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Bob, Bob Digman was just such a living letter with the spirit of God on his heart, which resulted in his encouragement of others over the years. And you might ask, how is this possible? Well, because of what Christ can do in us. Paul reminds us that we have this treasure within us, a power from God, not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. And so it is with us this day as well. Though we grieve and are sad in the midst of our loss of a husband, a parent, a grandparent, and a friend, we do not despair. We find comfort in God's word. We draw strength from one another in the community of believers. We seek to serve others in their time of need. And we say thanks be to God for the privilege of passing this way with Robert Digman and for the life in Christ Jesus that can be in each one of us. Amen.
On behalf of Jane and all the family, we thank you for your attendance today, whether it was in person or whether it's been on the video stream. We thank you for your support. We thank you for your love of Bob and your being here today. And the family would like to announce that there is a brunch in Crim Dining Room right across the lawn there in the cafeteria immediately following the service and all are invited to that and, and perhaps an opportunity to talk a little bit more, visit a little bit more with the family. And Jane is going to remain down here for a little while for those that might want to venture down here <laughs> to greet her and say hi to her, but she'll be over there also as well as the rest of the family. If you would, for our benediction, would you please stand if you can? A small verse in the smallest book in the Bible, I guess. From the book of Jude, he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Depart in peace.